Welcome to Anything Goes with me, Becky Walsh, a modern day agony aunt, for your life questions and for some deep insights you just don't get from your friends. Right, well, you know the rules by now. There aren't any. You can call about anything, anything goes. The number to call is 033 33 403 700. Now, on the show, we're going to be asking psychotherapist Roberta Verbrate, if you were born in the 80s and 90s, could you be having an early midlife crisis? Also, porn addiction, the epidemic that no one is talking about, and friendships at breaking point. When is it time to walk away? But we don't have to talk about any of those because anything seriously does go. I want to speak to you. The number to call, 033-33-403-700. And you can text, starting with the word Becky, followed by your message to 33333. So don't forget also you can treat, tweet me with any problems that you've got, things that you want to talk about, comments about the show or compliments if you fancy and we can solve any of your issues live on air. All you need to do is use the hashtag call Becky. In fact, Anthony in Tyne and Weir, he tweeted in to say how much is it per minute for the charges for the call? He's just asking for a friend. Hashtag. Well, Anthony, the good news is that the calls are charged at your local rate, but you're not even going to pay for the whole call because we will call you back. That's what it's all about, getting problems solved and not making you have to pay for it. Now, Deanna sent us an email in during the week, and if you want to email the show, it's becky at madetelevision.tv. She emailed in, I popped her a little message, and now we've got Deanna on the phone. Hi, Deanna. Hi. Hello, how are you doing? Well, so I know I'm why you really emailed well. in, but like, tell everybody what's going on and let's pull it apart and sort it all out. Well, I've been renting a workspace, I'm self-employed, um, from a friend for a few months. And we'd agreed that I'd take on a different space in the same building for the same price. Okay. And he's under more financial pressure in his personal circumstances than he was when we initially agreed. Okay. And he just kind of announced that he wants me to pay 25% more than we said. It's going to put me under pressure in my business to afford this. And I'm also feeling like he's trying it on a bit. Well, I like the um, way that you put the word he, announced. Like he's like, OK, so you're paying this. And oh, by the way, we agreed verbally, but you're now going to pay this. Is that how it kind of came about? It, yeah, it was like he, he um, showed me the you know, there's some renovations going on. He showed me the new room and he's like, and by the way, it's going to cost this. Ah, like he'd forgotten what um, he originally said. It was a little bit like that. And anyway, I sort of said that I'd have a chat with him about arrangements tomorrow. Yeah. And I'd really like to make sure that I stick up for myself fairly so that we end up with a deal that's fair and also so that I don't end up with an icky feeling about the whole conversation. Yeah, that, that horrible feeling, especially if it's a friend. And also it's hard to read yeah. whether or not he announced it out of embarrassment, like, oh, and by the way, blah, 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 because I'm just going to say this really quickly so that I don't have to actually go look into your eyes or deal with exactly. this. Exactly. You know, or arrogance, which is, hey, you're just going to have to put up with that. Eh. You know, <laughs> there was a B sounding word that came into my head. Um, so I think the thing to do here is there's a really lovely sentence, which to, is to just simply say, this is not OK with me. Because people react when you kind of go, oh, well, you agreed this and now you've changed your mind. And when we become accusational, there becomes like a resistance. And then they go, well, I've shown you all of this stuff and you now need to pay this. And I agreed that verbally, but I can't stick to it now. And then you're getting into conflict. But if you say something like, it's mm. not OK with me that you're changing our original verbal agreement. Also, the other thing I would do is... Whenever you have a verbal agreement, always follow it up with an email. I mean, I know it's a little bit late now, but what you can do in, for future reference is to say, oh, great, great to see you today. What I understood from our meeting is that you're going to charge me such and such. I'll be moving in on such and such a date. Lovely to speak to you, blah, 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 because we're friends. We don't want contracts. In fact, I don't want contracts at all, really. But it's a really nice idea just in an email just to underline what it is that you've said that you agreed. But because you haven't done that, that's fine. Now, well, we, we, have, we did do uh, that. But oh, clever girl. That was a few months ago. Did do that. I was like, so I've been moving it. But, you know, I don't think that makes a difference. He's like, it's going to cost, you know. 
Um, it does make a difference. If... It makes a massive difference because then, you know, when we were talking before about him sort of like going, oh, I've sort of forgotten what we'd agreed, like it, like it never happened. Once you've got that in writing, it absolutely happened. And then also you can say, it's not okay with me that mm. the price has changed. I'd like to stick to what we agreed in the email because you're underlining the fact that it was in writing. So it's no longer a gentleman's or gentlewoman's verbal agreement, but it is now actually a written agreement. And so even though he may turn around and say, well, look, I'm sorry, but I can't stick to that anymore because this, this wasn't what I anticipated. You're going to have to play hardball and you're going to have to say, well, look, I've moved my life around, my business around, my clients around or students around in order to be able to do this because this is what we agreed. If you change this, I can't undo all of that work. So we're going to have to keep to the actual original plan. Does that make sense? Are you OK to do that? I think so. I think the room might be worth a bit more than I'm actually paying for it. So I don't think he's being 100% just ridiculous in his request. But it's just I'm not cool with the announcing and also think 25% is is quite a big leap. It's a huge leap. And it's um, also, it's, it's really just saying it's not okay with me because it is a huge leap. Are you happy to walk away from this if he kind of folds his arms and goes tough? I'd rather not make, a, I basically want to be judicious. And, and that's why I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to come on and, and get some feedback because it could be a really good situation for me in the medium term. Yeah. But I might let him know that I am looking at a couple of other spaces because I suspect it's still going to be better for him to have me in at our originally agreed yeah. price than you not could... to have anyone in. You could come up with a compromise, Deanna, you know, and say, look, as a, a, you know, I'd like to stick to the original plan, but as a gesture of goodwill, I love that sentence, a gesture of goodwill. Um, gesture, I'll, make a note. Make I'll a note. A gesture of. Um, I'll agree to go up 10%. So that's what I would do, Deanna. Thank you so much for your call. I hope that helps. And good luck tomorrow. Thank you. That Team is Deanna. brilliant. Thank All you right. very Thank much. Thank you, Deanna. You take care. Good to speak to you. We've got Bethany now on the line. Hi, Bethany. A very quiet Bethany. Bethany, speak up. You are through. Hello. Hello. Hi, Bethany. Hi. What made you call into the show? Uh, hello. Um, I'm Stephanie. Hello. Did I call you Bethany? I'm, I'm sorry, Stephanie. 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 Sorry. Hello. It's okay. Some people guess my, uh, my name mixed up anyway. That's all right. What made you call into the show? How can I help? I tell you um, what, basically, there seems to be right. a bit of a delay, and I think what it is is, mm -hmm. have you got your TV volume on? If you can talk, yeah. turn yeah, turn your TV volume down, and then you'll be able to hear me through the phone because there'll be a delay between okay. what you're hearing on the telly and what I'm saying, and then you'll be listening to the yeah. telly, and then you'll be listening to me, and then there'll be yeah. a delay, and then everyone will be wondering why you're not talking to me, and then okay, now you've had time to turn the television down while I was just talking gibberish. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. so tell me why you called in the show. Um, basically, uh, my friend who's disabled, mm. and um, he he wants well, the man wants Sam out in two months' time. Okay. And basically, um, I don't know what to do really, and because like he wants us out, and I'm completely doesn't know what to do, like because his mother's house is meant to be um, organised to have a wet room and extension to pour in and everything, and they haven't started and I don't know what to do at all. You know, the thing is, is that when something is happening that is like proper kind of lifestyle crisis for somebody, it's the best thing to do is literally stick your heels in because human beings have an unbelievable compass compassion for each other. And we assume that people are going to be absolute difficult idiots. And honestly, that isn't normally the case. And if you speak very honestly and openly and, you know, be really clear and direct about your concerns and about your needs, then you're going to be able to get these people to be able to understand. But, you know, you can you can literally just stick your heels in and basically say, look, this is what's happening. This is what we need. This is about, you know, really a human element here so what I would say to you is don't worry about what might happen in the future just decide that all you have to be do all you have to do is be really clear about human rights and just stick to it and understand that people mm -hmm. will be able to, they will help you they will try and help you does that make sense yeah 
Okay, so just make sure that you just really keep to that as well. You know, you're a very compassionate girl, I can tell by your voice, and you do your best to make life better for everybody else around you. And I think that sometimes we sweep ourselves under the carpet and forget the power that we've got. You've got an awful lot of power in yourself, so just put your foot down, keep it down, and support the people around you that you care about. I hope that helps. Lovely to speak to you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your call. Thank you so much. We're going to go into a break right now, but we'll be coming back, and I want to be answering your calls. So if you want to give the show a call, the number to ring, 033 33 403 700, and we will be coming right back to you after a break. And don't forget, you can text on 888 332 if you're a little bit shy. We're going to be coming back right after the break. Hope to speak to you soon. Welcome back to Anything Goes with me, Becky Walsh. Remember, you can get involved by calling 033 33 400, no, 403 700. How many times do I say that number? Now, people in their 20s having a midlife crisis. Now, a midlife crisis is when you look at your life, you look at your achievements and you think, oh, poop. So those feelings of loss, low confidence, self-esteem, anxiety, a sense of even disappointment, I've been seeing in my clients, especially anxiety in amongst people in their 20s. So to put some light on this, joining me on the phone is Roberta Vobrate, who is a psychotherapist. Hello, Roberta. Uh, hello, Becky. Hi. Hi. Hello. So. As a psychotherapist, I just want to talk to you really about people in their early 20s who are having a bit of a crisis. I certainly know at the age of 27, I had a bit of a, a well, I wouldn't call it a breakdown, I'd probably call it a breakthrough, where I suddenly realized I no longer gave an absolute monkey stuff what anyone thought of me. But before that happened, there was a lot of sense of anxiety about my identity. Now, obviously, I'm of a, a bit of a different, I'd like to say a bit of a different generation. I'm being kind to myself, but I'm of a different generation. Now, this generation, you know, you've got new IT and social media and stuff that I certainly, it really wasn't around in, in my life. So in your experience, what is the major cause of anxiety of people in their 20s currently? Well, um, Becky, to be honest, I think it, you pointed out a really good thing is where do people come from the generation? So people in the 20s today, they are children of families that are considered the baby boomers. So mm -hmm. they were born in between, you know, 80s and going forward from parents that kind of knew that working hard would bring you to a certain result. And as long as you did your studies, you would achieve something. So the kids, you know, that were grown up from that generation kind of feel that they are um, main character of a special story, that definitely everything is in front of them as long as they do all the right steps. Now, what has happened with the advance of technology is that every right step has been accelerated massively. And the current theme in the, in the fear of people in their 20s is the fear of missing out. It's actually an acronym. In fact, it was coined a few years ago, FOMO, just to really describe that, a psychological disorder caused by onward march of technology, where you're constantly faced with other people, your peers at the same age, of what they're achieving, what they're doing. So the comparison is much heightened and it's much faster. Um, a lot of people suffer from that simply by just looking at their peers, never mind the job situations that they have. So are you talking about kind of like when people are like looking at Facebook and we all basically know that like Facebook is like a, <laughs> I'd just say, it's a lot of people kind of like really over exaggerating what they're doing. And when we're looking at Instagram and things like that, where people are harvesting the best photos that make them look like they're having the most interesting life. Do you feel that people are actually getting stressed out because they're getting competitive with a false identity of a, a whole load of other people that probably aren't doing as well as we think everybody is doing. Is that what's stressing people out? 
That is absolutely on the spot, Becky, because effectively what's happening here are two phenomena. One is the social media and networking has, in fact, mainly been blamed because it gives you a visual effect of what you're missing out on. So you log on to your Facebook and you see pregnancies, engagements, houses being purchased, constantly plastered. So if you're not feeling that you are the par, although these people generally are your friends, you're feeling that you have to compete. You will post the best pictures of yourself. You will post only positive feedback, which then what it brings you is to a false self. And you have to live up to that expectation constantly, which can cause quite deep depression, actually, if the reality is not true. Oh, really? So, so what you're saying there is like a false self. So, so you create a persona. Now, I mean, throughout my life, I've changed jobs. I've changed entire careers. I've done really different things. Do people, do you think that people are kind of sticking to something because they feel that they can't be fluid with their lives either? Do they get stuck, do you think? I think they get stuck, but also they get stuck by the fact in another time, let's say 20 years ago, having had a job right after university and having, let's say, an average salary, mm. uh, salary was considered an achievement. These days, because of the rush of getting somewhere, they feel stuck because everybody else seems to be doing better. But that's where the false self part comes in. Is it actually true that everybody else is doing better? Or are their Facebook profiles in the same way built of aspirations of what they want to be? Now, don't get me wrong, we all have a full self overall in our time. On our three first months of dating somebody, we tend to show the best side of us. That is not as much as false as is the best representation. What happens with Facebook and the job, especially market, around the 2025, is there is an incredible competition and it's very hard to live up to it. Yeah, three, three months of showing your best self in a new relationship. I think I managed about three weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and I know that also people in their well, 20s... Well, I guess, you know what, that's, that's very well pointed out. That is literally, you were saying three weeks. This is how much the technology has advanced our understanding of that. Absolutely. It's good. It really is very crazy. And I also think that a lot of people, because IT seems to be one of these careers that you really want to get into because you earn loads and loads of money if you work in IT. So a lot of these, you know, kind of like kids in their 20s are sort of like earning loads of money. Are some of them kind of like just earning the kinds of money that, you know, <laughs> us in our 40s can only dream of. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. That's an incredible feeling, isn't it? Like you can imagine being at uh, 25 and feeling on top of your career. Yeah. Having money you never thought of and kind of, you know, feeling quite precious about it. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because obviously somebody can enjoy, you know, the, the fruits of their career. But one thing that it can possibly cause is a fake value of money. Ah. There is because you're getting so much so quickly, you yeah. don't quite understand what it's actually worth in the real world. Yeah. I think, you know, a good exercise would be to look, what is the average salary across all of the UK? Not specifically, for instance, big cities like London that have some IT departments that are very um, profitable. So it, it causes a sensation of they don't quite understand to the fullest what that money is worth. And also, if you're earning the maximum you can at the age of 10 to 25, you know, the sense of, so what's next? What should I be achieving next? So what, you know, what is the next target for my salary can be really, really discouraging because the next, if you are at your best, might not be more. Yeah, I mean, they always say never fulfill your dreams because you're just going to have to dream harder on something else. What well, you know, I, I find this and I, I know that, you know, you're a psychotherapist and I kind of like work as a coach and a catalyst. Um, I found that a lot of my clients suffer from anxiety. I've, I've never known people have so much anxiety in their lives. As a psychotherapist, what practical tips can you give people to cope with anxiety? Well, I think the main thing is try to be in the here and now. For instance, if you have worked really hard or you just managed to, you know, get in one of those careers that are really high paying quickly, try to enjoy one step at a time. Try to take now and enjoy the fact that you have actually finished uni, that you did manage to get a job according to your specialization, and try to celebrate that. Because taking the time to do that is going to give you two things. One is learn from the mistakes made and recharge your batteries to go forward. Second is to literally have a sense of achievement because what's happening with this constant race is that nobody stops and thinks, you know, 
today I actually have it good enough and that would really really help to calm the anxiety down. So it's like a little bit like kind of climbing halfway up the mountain and all you're looking at is how much further you've got to go instead of turning around and actually looking at the view, sitting down, having your jam sandwich and actually looking at your life and kind of enjoying the achievements instead of like looking at Facebook, looking at what you haven't done, looking at all of the people who are on holiday in the Maldives when you're not going anywhere and feeling crappy about everything that you've got when actually you've got quite a lot. You're just not really seeing it because you're looking at what you don't have instead of what you do have. Is that a good way of describing what you're saying there? That is perfectly describable. It is literally like looking, you know, at, at just the whole tree without looking at the branches. And it is important to look at the detail and to feel fulfilled if one is doing. And in terms of technology, I would highly suggest, because there is this anxiety of constantly checking your Facebook updates or your emails or your texts, sometimes it can get quite annoying if you're meeting somebody and they're always on the phone. Try to have no tech time, at least a little bit every week, whether it's over a weekend or on Sunday afternoon, where you choose an activity that will not involve you socializing on social media. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really, really, really good idea. Just kind of like unplug from life, get out in nature, look at trees. I always find that being in uh, wide open vistas as well. So if you're kind of like looking across a field or looking out over the ocean, that really kind of calms the brain down as well. Because when we're kind of in confined spaces or in around buildings, it's almost like the brain needs to have that open vision to be able to feel at peace and kind of calming down and really getting back to what matters, which is usually exactly as you've said, Roberta, the here and now. Thank you so much for um, talking to us, Roberta. I think that that's going to help people quite a lot and make them feel not quite so alone and not quite so strange in that 20-something anxiety that can come up. Thanks ever so much, Roberta. You take care. So, so do you suffer from anxiety? You can give us a call and we will sort you out. The number to ring 033 403 700. I've got some more tips and skills coming up for you after the break. And don't forget, if you're too nervous to call, you can always text, start your text with Becky, 888 33 is the number. And we'll be coming back to you straight after this break. Welcome back to the show, I'm Becky Walsh. Now, did you know that the fashion of keeping your flower beds on your lady garden so tightly trimmed comes down to the porn industry? Yeah, absolutely nothing to do with personal hygiene. We have been brainwashed into believing that we have to be all cut up, neat and tidy, because it's a view and an aesthetic thing that comes from the porn industry. Aren't you outraged? Isn't that crazy? I mean, not to mention the ingrowing hairs. Oh, I just mentioned ingrowing hairs. Oh, I mentioned it twice. So the porn industry has actually changed the way in which we make love to each other. And I am not kidding. You see, as a woman who has had experiences with guys who are way too young for me, in fact, I actually wrote a book about that under the name Rebecca Stone. It's called Cupcakes and Coffee. Nice little summer reading, I think you'll find. But from actually dating guys who are like 21 to dating guys who are of my own age and older, I can tell you that there is a significant difference to lovemaking and I am putting that fact down to the porn industry. It really has changed the way in which young people have sex. It's created performance anxiety in men, and not only that, but porn addiction is on the rise. To the point where someone that I know, and I'm mentioning no names, no patrol, because I wouldn't do that, actually made love to his partner and felt like he had to go home to watch porn right after what is going on now addictions are kind of crazy thing because you can get addicted to anything you can get addicted to sex drugs well possibly rock and roll but you can get addicted to anything and addiction comes about from having a sense of not feeling completely whole in yourself so something's going on here with how we feel about ourselves and addictions especially to porn now joining me on the line is emma hello emma Hello. Thanks so much for calling into the show. So we're talking about porn addictions and things like that. What are your experience with guys? And would you actually watch porn yourself? Because we always assume, because guys are very visual, that women don't like porn. Have you ever watched porn and enjoyed it yourself? Yeah, I've totally watched porn and absolutely loved it. Um, 
quite like gay porn, a bit, bit random. <laughs> it's not random. It's not I can kind that. of understand that. Twice the thing you like <laughs> in one sitting. Why wouldn't you? Exactly. <laughs> it's not a bad thing at all. More for your money. Yeah, yeah completely. No, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, I because I'll tell you something. Do you think, sorry, Emma, I'm cutting you off here, but do no. you think that if you were watching heterosexual porn that you actually do that thing that women do, which is like, oh... She doesn't want to be looking like that. <laughs> Aren't we critical of each other? So it's probably more enjoyable you know, to watch two guys. No, you know, sometimes when I watch um, heterosexual porn, it, it, it's, it's like sometimes the women, you can see that they're not enjoying it and it's, yeah. it's kind of fake. Exactly. You know I mean? and, they, and you kind of, it ruins it because you just think she's not really enjoying that and you just think, oh, don't, you know, and at least with the guys, you kind of, I don't, I've never really had that feeling when watching guys like get it on I don't know and it's always like kind of really masculine and raw and lots of sweat and I love and that all that so um <laughs> yeah maybe, maybe that's the reason don't know. so in your own experience do you think that there's a difference mm. between older guys and younger guys when it comes to love making nowadays nowadays what do I sound like like a right um, old bird <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean you know past kind of couple of years I've been kind of um having more experiences with kind of young guys and I'm definitely noticing that there's kind of more of an, a performance kind of anxiety you mm. know and kind of erectile dysfunction not because you know there's anything wrong with them because they're young virile guys but mm. just because it's like this super like pressure to yeah. perform do you know what I mean got to be good got to be great got to do this got to do that and it's just like I have to take time to kind of break down those barriers and just kind of laugh it off and just like get everything back down to be chilled and relaxed and just like fun it up again because it just feels like it's like this huge amount of pressure and it's just like it doesn't have to be like that it's supposed to just be fun and pleasure it's not supposed to be like you know okay I've got to like make her come like 20,000 times and she's got to do this and do you know what I mean it's it's, it's I don't know it's, it's, it's interesting it's interesting and I actually my my previous boyfriend we had quite a long discussion about this and he said like when he was younger him and his mates all all watch porn and all have been massively influenced by watching their generation being exposed to and having access to so much porn like you know on the internet and and all that kind of stuff and on their phones and all that kind of stuff it's so accessible to them and, and that's what what they see they don't see the whole love making or having a bit of fun or or anything like that they just see this kind of hardcore you know like yeah. you were saying before, no hair and, and all that kind of business going on and, you know, coming in the face, all that kind of stuff, coming in the face. And know, it's all, it's I like... mean, apart from anything else, it just feels like such a disrespectful thing to kind of do. But I think that you, you're right that when we think about the film industry, like just normal film industry, you know, we've escalated violence in films, so everything gets escalated because once you get used to something, you don't get the same adrenaline kick out of it. So you have to kind of escalate yeah. violence in films. And exactly the same thing has happened with the porn industry, that it would have been kind of, you could just get your rocks off from just kind of like seeing two people getting it on. It's like, you know, it's like those um, 0898 numbers where they would never even stay on to the faked orgasm. They would have just been like, oh, wait, woman's voice, right, done. And now it's like <laughs> escalating it up. So. There's more, um, like you say, like coming in the face or like back passage stuff, like everything else that the more extreme sexual activity that can be a little bit dangerous. Um, you know, oh, I've got this in my eye. <laughs> that can be a little bit more dangerous is is actually now becoming the norm. And so, uh, you know, I've certainly found and, and what I'm hearing from a lot of my female friends is things that are just being taken completely for granted, like anal sex, like coming in the face, like all yeah. of those kinds of things that is that yeah. it's being pushed upon them a lot more than actually it's 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 almost like sex has become kind of like an extreme sport because that's what they've actually been seeing in these porn films do you think that's true yeah yeah no definitely I mean even you know not like a couple of months ago um I I had a guy and he um came over and stuff and you know I didn't I didn't want to well I, I was it was my time of the month, so I didn't wasn't really comfortable enough to kind of go the whole way. And he kept on asking me if I pick it up the bum. Do you know what I mean? And I was just yeah. like, you know, if you asked once, he asked five times. Just thought, do you know what? This is the first time that you've been home with me, mate. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, you, take no for an like answer. Five times. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Just, I, I just felt like, wow, that's really like ballsy and just like, and also for me, something that you would do when you've been in a relationship a little wild, do you know what I mean? And you well, it takes a trust, hell of a lot of trust. It's a massive trust thing yeah. to do that, do you know what I mean? Like, and it's like, not something you do just on like a first 
night, like, you know, home or whatever. I just, yeah. I don't know, I just, uh, that as well, I just thought, I've never had that happen before. Like, that's, yeah. you know, odd, but, you know, yeah. I guess it's part of it, really. I think it, I think it's it normal, kind of is you know, part of it. It's just like, oh, okay. Yeah, it, no, it's I becomes like that. It's like the big. escalation of it. And we haven't really talked too much about the addiction of porn, but you can see why that adrenaline kick comes up. Could be addictive. Thank you so much for your call, Emma. It's lovely to talk to you. And thank you so much for your candor, because I think there's some people who are going to have been able to been able to really learn something from that conversation. I hope so, anyway. We are all about making oh. good lovers in the world. Thank you, Emma. Thanks so much for <laughs> ringing in. You take care. Bye-bye. We've got Terry on the line. Hi, Terry. What made you call the show? Hiya, um, I do agree with porn, I've watched it myself, but I'm just wondering about, um, do you agree with like, escorts and stuff like that? What do you think of escorts and things? Sorry, I missed that, what did you say? What, do you, do you agree with like, as well as porn, escorting escorts. and stuff like that? Escorts, yeah. What, yeah, what's the question, what are you asking me about it? Like, do I want a job or is that something you do or what do I <laughs> feel about it? Or do you think, you know, how what do you do apply you to do about it? What do I feel about you it? Feel it? You feel it's wrong if you're in a, um, a relationship and they know about it? What, so for example, if you're in a relationship and your partner is seeking, you know, an escort or somebody else, so I'm not quite sure what the question is. When you've got an escort, like if your partner's sleeping with an escort when you're together, or are you talking about bringing an escort into your relationship? Um, one of us is an escort. Yeah. So basically, they knew that it was happening when yeah. they got together. Yeah. But then stay, we stay together, and I've, I've had nothing but um He's telling you to give it the job. And, yeah. yeah. She, but she's also done it as well. So, <laughs> yeah. But still, I'm the one in the wrong. It's you know really I mean? hard. Do you know, actually, I, I've had I've had actually four escort, um, well, four clients that are escorts that have had relationships as well. One never told their partner about that. So I think, you know, it's, it's a really difficult thing because when you meet and they're like, OK with it, and then the ego clicks in and then they start the, the visualisation in their brain starts going and they start thinking about what's happening and start worrying about it. I think you've you've got to really, in a sense, make a decision about whether or not this job has so much meaning for you and that it's purposeful for you that you want to continue with it no matter what your partner says. And so the, the problem is, is we get into this kind of thing where there's no right or wrong because this is not academic. It's about feelings. And if somebody feels jealous or hurt or confused, that's just how they feel. And no amount of logic is going to talk them out of feeling like that. But at the same time, if this is what you enjoy doing and this is your job and it's your livelihood, then they also can't put pressure on you to, to not be doing that job. Does that, does that make sense? It's not about the academics, it's all about the feelings. Yeah, it's, yeah she thinks I get feelings from it, but I actually don't. OK. Well, lovely for your call. Thank you so much for ringing in. I'm sorry I didn't have more time with you. I'm really sorry. We're going into a break. I'll be coming right back after this and I'll be taking your calls. We're nearly at the end of the show, so don't leave it too late. If you want to get in your call, you really need to do it now. The number to ring is 0333 403 700. Now, before we went to the break, we were talking to Terry, and Terry has a partner who is working, no, Terry is working as an escort and her partner doesn't agree and we were kind of talking about that and we were kind of running out of time towards the break. So Terry, I just wanted to recap a little bit about what we were saying there. I think it's a really tough call when you care for somebody because you worry about what they're doing work-wise, but also as well, there's all of that insecurity that it kind of coughs up with people as well. And I think that you've got to really think about whether or not if this career means something to you or if it's just something that you're doing or if it's something else that you want to do, there's lots of there's lots of different reasons why we do what it is that we do. And nobody wants to be told what to do, even if it's by our partner, even if they're saying it because they love us. We don't always want to be told how we have to live our lives. And I think sometimes in relationships, we need to have partnerships rather than people who get so embroiled in our lives in a, in a really intense way where they kind of say, well, you're with me now and it's you and I against the world, that we become limited in love. 
Actually, sometimes relationships really do limit how you love. So for example, when you go traveling and you look at the tops of buildings in the world and you feel engaged with people and you get talking to so many people when you go traveling, it's amazing. But go traveling with a partner, that doesn't happen. You know, it may be very romantic in the bedroom because you're away from home, but you don't have the same level of interactions. And it's almost as if that when we're in a relationship, we limit love. We limit love of our friends. We limit love of, of people of the opposite sex. We just limit ourselves in relationship, which means that we believe that just because we're in a relationship with somebody that we have to be able to put our concessions into their life and there's no level of compromise. So what I'd say is that you need to be able to find some kind of compromise within this relationship and maybe explain why it's so important to you because if it is important to you then your partner's really going to have to understand that this isn't just a job it's a vocation and just because society doesn't understand that it's a vocation and society goes oh well that's just terrible that's what women do when women don't have any money or that's what women do when they're really up against it and they're on drugs or they're single parents or whatever. Sometimes people do it because they genuinely care and they work with all kinds of different people from all different levels of society and it is a vocation. So I would say if that's what's true for you then make sure that you stand up and say so. I think that that's a very important thing. We were talking at the top of the show about friendships and about how we can walk walk away from a friendship. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit as well because that also includes how to walk away from relationships. And I'm not saying, Terry, that that's what I'm advising you to do. But you know, there comes a point when you, it's what I call the washing up machine effect. It's like your washing goes around in the machine. I love my metaphors. The washing goes around in the machine, but it's only when the door goes click that you know that you can take your laundry out. So sometimes a relationship has ended and you kind of know it's done, but you can't walk away. It's like there's still unfinished business. There's still a connection there. There's still a learning of some kind that you need to get from that person. And then one day, the washing machine door just goes click. You open the door, you take your washing out and you move on with your life. Sometimes friendships are like that and relationships are like that. Even our connections with family members. Sometimes we just know when something is done and we're able to walk away from it. So I think that when it comes to relationships, if you feel that you're pushing something uphill, if something seems to be so much more effort than it needs to be, then you can think about that washing machine and just think that sometimes when the door goes click, it's just done and it's time to walk away. I heard a really great saying the other day, which is, if you are not losing friends, then you are not growing because in life we have to outgrow people. It's the way that it works and sometimes we have to grow, outgrow relationships and sometimes we outgrow careers. So I hope that that helps you a little bit, Terry. I just felt that we cut it a bit short and I wanted to give you a little bit more information on that. If you have any questions for me during the week, then please do send me an email. You can write to me at becky at madetelevision.tv. You can even leave a voicemail on this number, which you can call now as we're live on 033 403 700 but I know that the show repeats, so if you really want to leave us a message, then you can leave us a message and I will answer it when the show goes live next week. So we've got John on the line. Hi, John, what made you call the show? Well, basically, Becky, I have um, an awareness of pornography, I'm an awareness as far as I'm a Christian, and one of the leading pornographers of the era, of course, was Linda Lovelace. And if you've read Linda Lovelace's book and her extracts, she's had in various magazines. Yeah. Have you done that? No, I haven't. No, not at all. What well, she said about but, it. Well, I don't know how you can actually faithfully speak about it if you haven't had information of the woman who was the leadest, leading uh, pornographer, you could say, of her age. Linda Lovelace talks about the high suicide rate, the self-harm rate, the self-loathing rate, the sexually transmitted disease rate. And, and that's the from the performers rather than the people watching. <laughs> Well, it surely it, it will have an ongoing impact, won't it, Becky? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm talking, you're talking performers, I was talking viewers. So, so you're talking about the performers having all of those things happen to them? Yes, they do have those things happen to them. And I think that also um, pornography for a watcher yeah. is corrosive. Yeah, I think so but too. But you can tell by 
their pornography, how it's getting worse and worse and worse. It's it become is. It, more sadistic, it's escalating. more violent. I absolutely yeah. agree with you. That, that was a comment I was literally making. It really is. Tell me more, because we've talked in depth about, about the viewer aspect of it, but I'd really like to hear from you what you've read and what you feel about the people who actually take part in the porn industry. Do you feel that these are vulnerable people, or do you feel that these are people who have taken a particular career path that has actually ended up creating a lot of anxiety in their lives. What, what did you read about that? Well, I think basically, going from the articles I've read by people who've been involved in it, is that basically they get trapped into it. Uh. They get in a very attractive girl who very often starts just doing a pin-up photograph, and then somebody says, well, you can make a lot more money doing something else, sweetheart. Yeah. And it starts from there. And then, of course, they do get violated. They lose their self-worth. Yeah. For me, as a Christian, the only way of sex, really, is between a man and a wife. And I've been married for quite a long time, and I've had sex with no other woman but my wife, and we're gloriously happy. Why should I want to look at somebody else having sex with very often? There are, I mean, sex, sex really is about love, and love can take place between all kinds of people. So I know that you're a Christian, but I would have to disagree with you on that fact, because it's about love. Sex is an expression of love, and that can take no, place... Not. No, it's not. Sex is an expression of love. Sex is an expression, is an expression of, of love. I know no, that you. Not, of course, uh, it's not. Yeah. It, it, it's of course, it's not. Of course, it is. Of course, it's an expression of love. But it's not an expression of just having children. That's not what sex is all about. Sex is a physicality where we actually get to share our bodies with another human being in intimacy. And in actual fact, I personally believe it is a gateway to being able to understand God more deeply. Because if God is a creator, if that's the way that you want to look at it, sex is a form of creation. It does create babies, but it's creation through love. Love. So you can't tell no. me that sex isn't love. You, I, mean, I do. I, I, I can tell you. Well, you can, and I, I can disagree. You, well, so yeah, I can disagree with you because you're not going to tell me that people who have pornographic sex that they are having having love. Oh it's no, love. that's it's no. A mechanic, it's a mechanic. Sex is a gift from God. Yeah, but that, I understand what you're saying about the fact that that can be quite mechanical. I get that, which is the fact that what's happening is entertainment. And that, to me, isn't really about making love. And we're talking about making love. What you're seeing on porn films is entertainment. And to be honest, I think it really has very little to do with actual making love. It's not making love. It's entertainment. So I think I, I agree with what you're saying. What's interested me a lot about your call is that you're talking about what's actually happening to the people who are participating. I'm curious, as a Christian, and I reckon it's because of your religion, why did you start researching, because you've really researched it in depthly, why did you research, start researching porn? What attracted you to research it? Was it your religion? <laughs> no, what it was, it was just the fact that Linda Lovelace reported that I was converted to Christianity. Oh, I see. I thought you were going to say, Linda it was because I quite fancied actually... Linda Lovelace. I was going to say, that's not where I expected the conversation with you and I to go. <laughs> no, I didn't fancy Linda Lovelace. In fact, the woman, of course, said that she knew dozens and dozens of sex work, and this is, it, it's a sex, it's an industry. Yes, it Let's is. It's an industry. Being, being, and it sounds look, to me exactly like it's been a bit of a damaging one as well. Hey, listen, I'm going to have to let you go, but thank you so much sure. for the call. I really appreciate it. That was a really interesting conversation. And I'm so pleased that you brought up the other side of it as well, because it was something I'd only really considered from a viewer perspective. So thanks so much for your call. Wow, what an eventful evening this show has been this week. It's been so we have spoken to Roberta Verbate. She was telling us all about midlife crisis in your early 20s. We were talking to Emma about the pleasures of younger men and the expectations that are due to the porn industry. And Terry has been working as an escort and wanted to know how to deal with her job and how it's affecting her own love life. We also talked to John being harmful and that we have performance perspective when it comes to porn. Thank you so much for your calls. I'm looking forward to speaking to you directly next week. Don't forget you can email me becky at maytelevision.tv and you can leave a voicemail on 033-3340-3700 and tweet me at beckywalsh.com. Thank you ever so much. I hope to get you on the show next week. Thanks ever so much to producer Steve and the Maid team. Don't forget, live the life that lights you up. You've got this.